What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another video. We'll be going over every backfield today, talking about which running backs I'd be starting and sitting. But before we do that, have to start things off with the stat of the day. Yesterday's stat was just one running back ranks in the top 20 in fantasy points per game, but outside the top 45 in air yards per game, I asked who it was. And the answer is Robert Woods and Charles Rickman was the first to get that one right. Today's stat, who currently leads the league with 13 carries inside the five yard line. All right, first up, we have the Thursday night game between the Cardinals and the Seahawks. This is easily a top three game in the week and honestly is probably my favorite game. Should be awesome, should be a close one, should be high scoring, so it'll be fun to watch. The total right now is 57 and a half points and the Seahawks are three point home favorites. For the Cardinals, we saw a 50-50 split in the snap share last week between Drake and Edmonds. That resulted in 16 carries and one target for Drake, and then eight carries and three targets for Edmonds. As we've said every week, the Seahawks are a pass funnel. They're actually really good at defending the run, but terrible at defending the pass. So it would make sense that the Cardinals would lean towards the pass in this one, which is exactly what we saw last time these two played. Kyler had 48 pass attempts and 14 quarterback runs compared to just 19 carries for Drake and Edmonds combined. We also saw Edmonds used far more in the receiving game in that one, catching seven balls on, I believe, eight or nine targets compared to just one for Drake. I wouldn't be expecting seven receptions for Edmonds this time around, but I would expect the Cardinals to lean more towards Edmonds in that area yet again. That's what they've been doing every single week so far. There's no reason they're going to stop. Because of the volume in the matchup, I have both of them as flex plays. Again, Seattle, solid defense, but really high total. And both of them have touchdown equity. So I think you're playing them in the flex. If you got them, I have Edmonds one spot higher, but they are basically the exact same play. For Seattle, it seems like both Carson and Hyde are trending towards playing in this one. You'll probably know when you're watching this video, but that might, I guess, not come out until 90 minutes before lock, so make sure you pay attention to that. If that's the case and they're both active, then this is a good game environment and a neutral matchup, so a decent spot for the both of them. However, we don't really know what the snaps are going to be like. Again, both of them are coming off of an injury, and so I really want to see what beat reporters are saying. Right now, I'm treating it as Carson more of a flex play in his first week back, uh, and then Hyde would be more of a fringe play, but could we be in a situation where it comes out that Hyde's gonna get a full snap share, but Carson will be limited? Absolutely. Since we don't have that information right now, I'd say when inactives come out, when these reports come out, just check the rankings about an hour before lock and see what they say. Next up, we have Titans at Ravens. This game has a 49 point total, and the Ravens are six and a half point home favorites, which feels a little bit high to me. For the Titans, this is obviously not a good spot being nearly a touchdown road underdog against a good defense, but you're always starting Derrick Henry. For the Ravens, I would personally not start any of their running backs while all of them are active. They all had between six and eight touches last week, and that is just not going to cut it. Next up, we've got the Lions at the Panthers. This game actually does not have a line right now, but my model has it as Panthers one point home favorites and the total at 49 and a half points. The line isn't out right now because there is some ambiguity at the quarterback spots. Both Stafford and Bridgewater are hurt right now, and their status is obviously going to impact the line. I'll do this assuming that both are active, but if one of them is out, then it's a downgrade to their running backs and an upgrade to the running backs on the other side since the line would shift towards the other team. So for the Lions, we saw DeAndre Swift take over the backfield finally. It should have happened from day one, but I'm glad they have finally decided to make the correct decision. Swift played on a season-high 73% of the snaps, handling 16 carries, five receptions, turning that in to 149 yards and a touchdown. The shift also couldn't have really come at a better time since he's facing the Panthers defense this week. They ranked 25th in rush defense TVOA, 
20th in yards per carry allowed and have given up the fourth most fantasy points to opposing running backs. For the first time all season, DeAndre Swift is a running back one and no other Lions running back is playable. For the Panthers, McCaffrey is going to be out again this week and it seems like Mike Davis will be good to go after suffering the hand injury last week. He has been disappointing recently, but given his level of involvement, especially in the receiving game, and considering that the Lions have given up by far the most fantasy points per game to opposing running backs, Mike Davis is a running back one play this week. Next up, we have Steelers at Jaguars. This game has a 47 and a half point total, and the Steelers are a massive 10 point home favorite. For the Steelers, on the surface, it might seem like James Conner hasn't been involved as much recently, but they did run a lot of zero running back sets against the Cowboys, and then he played on 88% of the snaps last week, which was a season high. They've just been throwing the ball a lot because they have three elite wide receivers and a solid tight end, and that just makes sense to throw the ball a lot in that scenario. As 10-point favorites against a Jaguars defense that ranks 20th in rush defense DVOA, 25th in yards per carry allowed, and have given up the 6th most fantasy points to opposing running backs, James Conner is a low-end running back one. For the Jaguars, this is a brutal matchup. The Steelers have allowed the fewest fantasy points per game to opposing running backs, and the Jaguars have the lowest projected team total on the week at around 18 or 19 points. Despite this, James Robinson is still a low end one to a high end two in that like 11 to 14 kind of range, thanks to touch counts of 26, 25, and 25 over the last three weeks. He has a lower floor because of the matchup and the team total, but you play running backs getting 25 touches a game. Next up, we have Patriots at Texans. This game has a 48 point total, and the Patriots are two and a half point road favorites. For the Patriots, we have a bit of a mess. So last week, the snaps were split 55% for Damian Harris, 34% for Burkhead, and 17% for White. But the two weeks before that, it was Burkhead leading the backfield and White seeing a larger share. Now, that could have been game script related, it could have been matchup related, but it seems like they want to lean on Burkhead and Harris over James White as long as they're not down by a lot. If they get down by more, it's going to be James White and Burkhead over Damian Harris. So I guess Burkhead uh, it has the highest floor of these running backs, but as we saw last week, when they're winning games, when they're producing on offense, Damian Harris is the guy that benefits the most. One thing to keep an eye on is Sony Michel. I really hope they don't activate him, but there's always a chance that they do, and that would obviously decrease the value of all other running backs in the game. I would say the order of their ranking should be Harris, Burkhead, and James White, with James White kind of being a really, really fringy play, uh, Harris being like a low-end running back too, and Burkhead just a solid play in the flex, but you're probably going to need the touchdown from all of these guys to be worth it. For the Texans, David Johnson was placed on the IR with a concussion, and people don't usually go on the IR with a concussion, so that is clearly a problem, and it's really, really bad news, if we're being honest, for David Johnson owners. There is a very real chance that he either returns late in the season or doesn't return at all, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Last week, Duke played on 95% of the Texans' snaps, and he handled 100% of their running back touches. This is a, a workload that we've been just praying to see for years now, and while it didn't translate into fantasy production last week, it will soon. If Duke is going to be the featured back for these next few weeks, then he is extremely valuable. As for this week, I'd say he's more of a mid-range running back too, but with a lot more upside than other running back twos have because he is exceptional in the receiving game. And if the Texans get down by a bit and he has all the carries, all the goal line, and some targets, he'll be a really nice option. Eagles at Browns is up next. And this game opened as a 48-point total, but it's been bet down to 45 and a half points, and the Browns have stayed as three-point home favorites. For the Eagles, Boston Scott and Corey Clement may have scored two touchdowns last week, but they combined for only five touches on 19 total snaps compared to 17 touches on 48 snaps for Miles Sanders. Miles Sanders is the featured running back, and you're always playing him when he's active, even in a tough matchup as a road underdog. 
and you're not playing Boston Scott, you're not playing Corey Clement, I don't care what happened last week, they're not involved enough when Sanders is healthy. For the Browns, Hunt actually had his second highest touch total on the season in Chubb's return. Hunt had 19 carries and four targets compared to 19 carries and one target for Chubb. There was a lot of wind in that game though, so in general, I would expect fewer total touches for the running backs. It was just that it was so windy that they kind of had to just use the running backs and it was working. We know it was going to be a low total game, and so don't expect that every week. Also, the matchup. I mean, when you have a game that's extremely windy and the matchup says you should be running the ball, well, yeah, they're going to run the ball a ton. So don't expect that every week. Uh, but it's worth noting that Hunt is averaging over 15 fantasy points per game when Chubb is healthy this season compared to 18 for Chubb. So Chubb is still more valuable, obviously, but Hunt is still like a low-end running back one on average when Chubb is healthy. This week, the matchup is a little bit tough, but I have Chubb still as a low-end one and Hunt as a high-end two since both of them are still going to be very involved. Falcons at Saints is up next. This game has a 51.5 point total and the Saints are 5 point home favorites. For the Falcons, Gurley is getting insane volume, but almost none of it is coming in the receiving game and the Saints do have a top two run defense. The touchdown equity alone makes Gurley a mid-range running back too, but if he doesn't score, you're going to be very disappointed, so realize the floor is very low, especially in this matchup. For the Saints, the Falcons have a better run defense than most people think, but Alvin Kamara is matchup proof, and so he always needs to be played. And then Latavius Murray just doesn't see enough volume to be worth a start outside of maybe 16 team leagues. He's still a very good player to own because he has so much upside if Kamara went down, but you don't want to be playing him. Next up, we have the Bengals at the football team. This game has a 46 and a half point total, and the football team is a one and a half point home favorite. For the Bengals, it all depends on the status of Joe Mixon. If he's out again, then Bernard is a running back to play even in this tough matchup. I wouldn't expect him to be very efficient, but he's involved enough in the receiving game to produce decent numbers, even if, say, the rushing volume isn't there, even if he doesn't score a touchdown. He'll be involved enough to be a viable play. If Mixon is active, then it depends on how involved we expect him to be. I'd personally be a little bit surprised if he just returned and took over the full workload. Because of that, I probably wouldn't play him unless he practices on full on Thursday, full on Friday. He has no injury designation. Well, then, okay, we can play Joe Mixon. But I don't expect that to happen. It could, but I don't expect it to happen. And so I'd probably keep him on the bench even in the first week back from his injury. He wasn't a great play before the injury, and now he's coming off the injury. It's a tough matchup. I just, I don't own him, but I couldn't see myself playing him. And unfortunately, you know, if he does return, it kind of means he can't play Bernard either. For Washington, both Gibson and McKissick have been used a ton recently. Gibson had 13 carries and four targets plus two touchdowns last week. And then McKissick had eight carries and seven receptions on 15 targets. And he also scored a touchdown as well. McKissick was extremely bad on the ground, incredibly inefficient in the receiving game. But he's played 83% and 70% of the snaps over these last two weeks. And he's averaging 14 and a half targets per game over that time, leading all other players by five targets. He has 29 targets over the last two weeks, and he's beating Devonta Adams by five targets as the second most targeted player across all positions. That is insane, and you know it makes it so where if you're in a full PPR league, I mean, you're playing J.D. McKissick. Now, in a standard league, it's a little different in a half PPR. It's a little different, but honestly, in a full PPR league, you're playing J.D. McKissick. Even in a half PPR league, you can play him as a low-end running back too. I think Gibson, because of the touchdown equity, even though he's not getting as many targets, he's the guy to lean on the goal line. He's got a ton of touchdowns this season. That's going to continue. And so I think Gibson, honestly is like a mid-range running back two with McKissick as a low-end running back two, which is crazy to think about that Washington has two running back twos. But with Alex Smith at quarterback, these guys are getting so many targets because he doesn't throw the ball deep downfield that they're viable. And this team is good enough to score touchdowns. And if they're going to use Gibson a lot in the red zone, he's going to be viable. And so it's crazy to think, but both these guys can be played. Next up, we've got Dolphins at Broncos. This game has a 45-point total, and the Dolphins are three-and-a-half-point road favorites. 
For the Dolphins, Jordan Howard was finally cut, and Gaskin is still on IR, so that leaves the backfield down to Salvin Ahmed and maybe Breda. We have to see if Breda can return this week, but if he doesn't, then Ahmed is basically a lock and load running back too. He had 22 touches on 76% of the snaps last week. Looked pretty good. Should have probably had multiple touchdowns as well. And we should expect a similar amount of volume if Breda is out again. So if that happens, I would be playing him in your lineups. If Breda's back, I want to see reports as to who they think is going to get more of a workload. And then I'll adjust the rankings accordingly. For the Broncos, they continue to have their just gross split. Neither running back has been viable. And this is just not a good offense in general. And now Drew Locke is hurt again. So no matter what the final status of Locke ends up being, I would be fading both of these running backs. This Miami defense is actually really good, and the Broncos just aren't. Next up, we have Jets at Chargers. This game has a 47-point total, and the Jets are 8.5-point road favorites, even coming off their bye, which is pretty embarrassing, honestly. They are 8.5-point road favorites coming off the bye, playing a Chargers team that's not all that good. So this Jets team is quite bad. However, we're expecting LaMichael Pirine to be the feature back moving forward unless they change their mind, which I don't know why they would. And now this is the feature back on the Jets, so don't you know get too excited. But I have him as a flex play this week, and I'm hoping they give him around you know, 14 to 16 carries, around 4 to 6 targets. And if he sees that sort of volume, he's going to be a reliable player over this last month in fantasy. For the Chargers, Eckler is not returning just yet. He's getting closer, but he's not ready yet. And so with Justin Jackson also on the IR, that leaves the backfield down to Balaj Pope and Joshua Kelly. Balaj dominated the running back touches these last two weeks, getting 17 and 23 touches. He's not a very good running back. He hasn't been that great with these touches, but any player getting that sort of volume needs to be taken seriously. I do have Balazs as still like a low-end running back two to flex play. Not someone you need to start because I get it. He's getting like 20 touches, but he's not very good. In this matchup, the Jets are not a bad run defense, but since the Chargers are supposed to win this game, supposed to be leading, that does mean the running backs should get a lot of touches. So again, if you picked up Balazs, don't think he's going to be a running back one, but could you play him at running back two or flex? Absolutely, because of uh, the projected game script. If we're looking at Kelly and Pope, those are such thin plays. I mean, Pope didn't even have a touch last week, and Kelly has just been used as the backup no matter who the other running backs are. And so I'd keep both of them on the bench for sure. And then Balage again, running back two to flex. Packers at Colts is up next. This game has a 51-point total, and the Colts are actually two-point home favorites. For the Packers, always start Aaron Jones, even in a tough matchup. And then Jamal Williams is fine in the flex in deeper formats, but I certainly wouldn't go there in a 10 or a 12 team league. Even in a 14 team league, it's a pretty thin play. The Colts are a very good defense. For the Colts, Hines may have gone off last week, but he also did in week one. And then he followed that up with zero carries and one target in week two. The Colts are using these backs as a full-blown committee and they're just sticking with whoever is playing well in that matchup. If the Colts get down early, then Hines is more likely to be the one who's going to have a good game. But you know what? We saw them get up quickly last week and it was still Hines. So even though we have to think, let's say the Colts score two touchdowns to start the game, Wilkins and Taylor are probably going to be the lead backs in a game script like that. But do we know what the game script is going to be? No, I mean, it's a two-point projected difference. The Packers are a very good team, so I'd be very surprised if they can't get anything going on offense and fall behind. And so there is basically an even chance that all these guys are going to be leading in touches, and there's a very real chance that none of them end up being viable. I do have Hines and Taylor as flex viable plays if you need them, with Wilkins being a lower-end play. But again, it's if you need them. Hines definitely preferred in full PPR leagues, but talking about half PPR, you do not need to play any of these running backs, even in a great matchup, because they're splitting everything. But the order would be Hines, then Taylor, then Wilkins. Cowboys at Vikings is up next. This game has a 48-point total, and the Vikings are 7-point home favorites. And it is interesting to note that they opened as 9-point favorites, 
which was obviously too high, and it's dropped to 7, and I think there's a chance it goes below 7. So for the Cowboys, Zeke has not been good, but he has seen touch counts of 20, 12, 20, and 20 since Dak went down. And coming off the bye with Dalton coming back healthy, Zeke has nowhere near as much value as he did before the Dak injury, but he's getting enough volume to be a high-end running back to this week. And then Pollard, he's been getting good work. He's been producing really well on a per-touch basis, but the touches themselves aren't there enough for him to be anything more than a high-end bench option that you're not starting outside of probably 16 team leagues. For the Vikings, pretty easy. Always start Dalvin Cook, especially as a massive home favorite against a bad defense. And honestly, Alexander Madison is the same as Pollard. It's a really high-end play for your bench, but you can't be starting him. The Sunday night game is Chiefs at Raiders, and this game has a 56.5 point total, and the Chiefs are 6.5 point road favorites. For the Chiefs, they seem to be comfortable just letting their MVP frontrunner operate the offense, which is obviously a good idea. Mahomes has 27 total touchdowns to one interception on the season, so leaning on him over the running backs is a winning strategy. That's resulted in Clyde seeing about six carries and two receptions per game over the last three weeks, and Bell only seeing about five carries and one reception in that same time frame. The Raiders are a decent matchup for running backs, but this sets up much more like a Mahomes smash spot than it does for the running backs. Right now, I have Clyde as a flex play and then Bell outside my top 35 running backs. For the Raiders, this is a tough matchup. But Jacobs had 25 touches in their last meeting, and he's fresh off running a route on 63% of dropbacks, which is a season high for him. Jacobs is a must start every single week, and Booker is not. He is not someone that I would play, even with this production recently. It's come because of an injury, and it's come because they were just dominating last week. In a game that's remotely close. Booker is not getting nearly this much work, and so I would not be playing him again outside of like 16 team leagues. The Monday night game is going to be between the Rams and the Bucks. This game has a 48 and a half point total, and the Bucks are three and a half point home favorites. For the Rams, it is a gross committee against a Bucks defense that ranks second in rush defense DVOA and first in yards per carry allowed. I do not trust any of their running backs this week, and I would not play any of them if I had them. For the Bucks, Ronald Jones is fresh off 198 yards and a touchdown, although remember, half of that came on one carry. The Rams don't have a bad run defense by any means, but they're easier to run on than pass on. Ronald Jones had over 100 rushing yards in three straight games from week four through week six, but then he had 100 total yards in the three subsequent weeks combined. So we've seen him produce really well before. Three straight games over 100 rushing yards, and then he has three games combined with 100 total yards. So they're not just like, oh, he went off, gotta use him as the feature back. If he fumbles, if he's not producing, they're more than comfortable just throwing the ball a bunch or using Leonard Fournette. As of right now, I do have Ronald Jones as running back 18, so like a mid to low end running back two, and Fournette as the running back 25, so more of a flex play. I think the decision comes down to just who you have, what you need from them. Uh, if you don't need to play these two, you have other options, I would probably go there. I don't feel confident in either of them, but if you need one as a desperation play in your flex, I'm fine with it. Just realize the floor is pretty low. And then obviously, you know, you're not starting any other running back on this team. So that's a breakdown of every backfield in week 11. If you want to see my exact rankings on every player, you can check that out at our website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. But that's the end of this one. Hope you all did enjoy. If you did, then how about hitting that like button and how about subscribing to the channel if you're new? Thanks for watching.